D. McClung, Archer Monologues. This is episode 37, M. This is a continued continuation of the series, If I Were the President of the United States of America. Oh, by the way, this show is brought to you by D. McClung, Archer Monologues. That's me. And McClung Originals, making art for almost... 60 years. All right. If I were president of the United States, I think it would be a good idea to issue a proclamation divesting the federal government from all things marriage. There should be no marriage laws. The federal government should have no say in marriage. It should have no laws regarding marriage and if if at all possible I would <clears throat> I would end all vo- involvement of the marriage state marriage I don't think as a president I could direct the states to end their marriage programs <clears throat> if I could I would but I think I would work towards that goal because state marriage is a fraudulent government program. Now what's a program? A program is like food stamp program, social security program, things of such nature. A program. It is not how do I put it? It's not about marriage. Marriage is a inalienable, natural, shouldn't right. And any time, as I've mentioned before, any time you get a license for something from the government, you're becoming incorporated because that's the process. That's the concept. That's the way it works. It's a construct construct uh, of how things work in this country. If you ask for permission from the government to do something, you have become a corporation because the government is going to grant you the privilege of doing that thing. If you become incorporated, for example, you ask the government, I want to be incorporated, so I have you. And the government says, yeah, we'll grant you the privilege of engaging in a privilege or a corporate privilege. A fictitious entity privilege as opposed to, you know, the privileges you might have if you say we're given privileges by, oh, well, let's just say with your marriage. If you're married, you have a wife, there's a husband, you being the husband, let's say. And uh, you you ask your wife for permission to do something. Now you're not getting you're not being a corporation in that case because corporations are related to governments and the granting of privileges and the granting of certain uh, permissions to engage in certain rights and certain activities as a fictitious entity. So since a corporation is a fictitious entity, state marriage is therefore a fictitious entity. So you're not really married. You just think you're married. Why? Because the government told you, hey, you're married. Yeah. And you get a little piece of paper that says this is a wedding license or a marriage license. Oh, yeah, cool. So it is. Yeah, all right. And then you file that with the county clerk's office and, eh, you know, you become a filed on the record married, being corporation, engaging in the privilege of being married. I'm not making this up. This is com- I come about this very honestly by doing the research in the legalities, the legal system, the social and uh, cultural norms over the past couple hundred years or so at least in this case. And the point is, it's a government program, and I might add, a fraudulent 
government scheme to control you, to regulate and manipulate your life. And I'm not a conspiracy theory nut, but this is something that is quite clear and quite obvious. If you think about it, if you think it through to the logical conclusion, you can see that state marriage is not really marriage. It's a government program. I've said it again and again. Program. It's an invention. The purpose and motivation of this invention is to control and manipulate the people. If you go down to the state to get a marriage license and they say, eh, mm, no, then <laughs> you're not going to get married and join the program. <clears throat> you're not going to get to be a corporation, marriage corporation. <clears throat> Oh, by the way, I've heard people say marriage is an institution. Yeah, you know, in a sense, yeah. In the sense that it's a corporation. Not in the sense in which, well, in federal government or in state government, it's an institution in the sense that it is a fictitious corporate entity. It's not really marriage. It's just an arrangement that you have entered into with the government as one of the parties of the contract which nullifies the right to marry. And let me, let me explain something else about this. If you want to get married, get married. If you want to get married to another person, that's fine. If you want to get married to two or three people, yeah, well, if they agree, then you can have that contract. Because, yeah, and by the way, the marriage contract doesn't have to be written. It could be oral. It could be mutually agreed upon by arrangement. <clears throat> so bigamy is a federal government. Bigamy is a is a legal sense, a legal term that applies to government program, to government marriage program. It has nothing to do with you exercising the right to be married to more than one person at a time. It's a part of the fiction. The legal fiction called marriage, state marriage. You understand? Just I'm not making this up. This is just true. It's not a conspiracy. It's just the way it turned out after all these, uh, I'm going to say 160 years. Because before uh, 1859, there wasn't any such thing as state marriage. And I've explained this before. You... you I get married, get married. It, mar the concept of marriage is fluid. The definition of the word marriage is fluid. I mean, I know the federal government says marriage is uh, a corporate union between a man and a woman, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm guessing it is between two men and two women, two men, a man and a woman, and a, you know what I'm saying, man and man, woman and woman. And uh, they've added that. As, uh, aspect of marriage, federal fictitious marriage, to their program. So now, oh yeah, now you can do that. If you want to join the federal program or the state program called marriage, which is not marriage. Well, that's the way they get you. That's the way they babbleize and bastardize the English language. Let's call this marriage when it's not. And let's convince the people that it is when it's not. And if there's a hint of conspiracy, it comes from 1859 when the federal government decided, you know, we got to do something about the black folk. Oh, oops. Really? Now, it's my theory. And I'm not saying a conspiracy theory. I'm just saying a theory that in 1859, Civil War hadn't started yet, but it was getting there. And there were abolitionists, and there were those that didn't want to do away with slavery because they were like evil people. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, if you wanted to, if, if back in those days, if you lived there in that time, and you know, I, you know, I live in Mississippi, and I think the Negro, blah blah blah, you know, 
you're a racist scum. I'm sorry. So in today's world, definition is the same. You think the black folk haven't got the rights that the white folks have got, then, oh yeah, by the way, privilege, white privilege, yeah, really, I'm not even going to go into that nonsense. But, if you get married, you want to get married, you decide what that is, because in a free country, in a free society, you know, the government doesn't tell you what it is you're doing any more than they tell you what you can and cannot do. As long as you don't hurt other people, violate their rights. That's other human beings, not, you know, corporations. Then, you know, do what you want. But people want to marry trees and pigs and shit. Well, if the tree doesn't object, then if it makes the guy happy, go ahead, marry a tree. It's not a real thing. <laughs> it's a concept. You understand what I'm saying? So, what I'm getting at here is that marriage is an inalienable human right. If you get a license to get married, you're becoming a corporation and you are giving up your right to marry. And you are giving up your right to control that relationship. And a lot of people get married. Oh, I forgot to continue. 1859, racists said, we're going to have some problems here when these slaves are free, they're going to want to intermingle. And so one way to stop that or prevent it or handicap it a little bit was to make a law saying, you know, white people can't marry black people. So you can't get a license. Ah, I want to get married. What are you, Bessie? Ah, uh, I'm now want you to get married to. Okay, Kunta Kente. Ah, I want to get married. Uh, Mabel, white. Mm, shit, me too. Let's go down and get a marriage license, because, you know, kind of say, like, we should do that. And they go down and do it, and then, nope, you can't get one, because they're going to be, black and white people aren't getting married. Nope, not going to happen. See? Which means you can get married, but you just can't do it with a piece of paper. Because <laughs> marriage has nothing to do with that. You don't need permission to do what you have a right to do. Do I need to repeat that? You don't need permission from the government to exercise a human right. Marriage is a human right, just as same as the right to free speech, the right to practice your religion as you see fit, even if you're wrong. <laughs> and, you know, you have the right to uh, <clears throat> do what you want, wear what you want. Well, you know, from my last podcast, you have the right to wear what you want or not wear anything at all if you don't want to, even though they have laws. I'm going to get to that one. <clears throat> so, if I was president, and if it were possible, I would certainly end federal involvement with the marriage program by abolishing it, and I would get the federal government out of the marriage business or marriage circumstances. And I would expose it at the same time as the program for what it is. And explain to the people of America you don't want to trade a right to marry for the privilege. Yeah, I'm going to make a little speech and say so when I do that as president. Proclamation. No more state marriages. Uh, federal involvement in marriage. And we will no longer tolerate state marriage programs hindering the exercise of the right to free speech, the right to uh, marry. So there, that's that. And uh, by the way, people have been getting married forever, and uh, they've been doing it for a long time before the government decided to make it some kind of rule or law or whatever. You know, Abraham Lincoln was not married by the state. He was married in the traditional way, and he was the last president to be married in the traditional real way. <clears throat> because after that, uh, 1859, because he was already married, see, um, in, in a real sense of the word, and uh, so the, they they didn't. And, well, let's do something to stop these black folk from marrying white folk, and state laws and so forth for many years, generations actually, 
uh, prevented black and white people from marrying, even though they have a right to do so. So, if I were president, I'd work on that, try to get that, get the government out of state and federal government out of marriage, and stop regulating the human right, stop licensing something that they're not allowed to license, etc. So that's that's how I feel about that marriage thing and the government, if I was president. So hold on a minute and take a short break. Moving on to uh, the next topic of what I would do if I were president. <clears throat> I would end the drug war, the war on drugs, end it like today. Inauguration day. Now, I might not get to it on the first day. How about the second day? We'll get to it on the second day. Drug war is now ended. Case closed. End of story. Done. So, all of you DEA and all of you other fascist cops and, and, and criminally oriented tyrants in America will cease and desist. No more arresting people for marijuana. No more putting people in jail for anything that has to do with drugs. What we will do is establish clinics for people who are affected by drugs, who need help quitting, who need, or, uh, need some uh, mental or physical health cons uh, involvement. We'll set up some clinics, we'll set up some counseling, we'll set up across the country. And um, that might be a state thing, but we as the federal government, or as I as president of the federal government, will make it a priority that all states in the union provide help for people who are involved in drugs if they choose not to be involved in drugs, if they choose not to smoke marijuana. I mean, come on, you don't need a doctor, you don't need a therapist if you smoke pot. Your, your family and friends might, might have to do an intervention if it's out of control and you know, your life is being disrupted by it. And the same goes for heroin or any other drug. And we need to end the stigma a lot of good people take drugs, including marijuana and so on. Misguided behavior, in my opinion, and they need help, and they should have it. All right, that's what I would do on, say, day two. In that business, that terrorism on the people and population of America, and, and, as a subset of that particular act, I would have every prisoner in America, their cases reviewed, every single one of them. After all, we're the most imprisoning country on the planet, which is kind of like a contradiction to the concept of land of the free, all and brave, you know, when, you know, millions of Americans are in prison for, you know, you know, drugs, just insane. And it's unethical. And it's, in my opinion, illegal. So I would have every case reviewed. Everybody that's in prison or jail because of marijuana or possession of it or uh, allegedly distributing it and so forth, bingo. Those cases would be summarily, how would you, how would I call it? The, they would be released from prison or jail. They would just simply be pardoned, as it were. And, uh, and the charges against them would be expunged as a part of this program to end this insanity against people. It's not a war on drugs. It's a war on humans and human folly. But anyway, that's part of day two. What else? I'm not sure if I mentioned this before. I think I did. The other, the other, uh, the other episode. I would end 
the reign of terror of the IRS and end the illegal largest financial crime in American history that would end the illegal misapplication of the income tax on human individuals who are not corporations. Call that day two or even day three. A little memo over to the IRS, no more. From now on, you can only engage in collecting or imposing the income tax on corporations as it is legally required to be done on the law and regulations that exist on the books today. I, you know, duh, in that. I'm not going to go into great detail, but uh, Congress has never imposed the income tax on individual Americans. There is no law making individual Americans liable. The 16th Amendment does not give the government the power to impose the income tax on individuals. That amendment, 16, was created as a blind to try to convince people that, oh, it's okay, we're going to rob you, but we're going to do it because we've got, we got an amendment. <clears throat> you follow me? No. Eh, we just convince them that that applies to them and not just corporations. And then they'll believe it in a couple of generations. When was it? 1913? And it's been over 100 years, and bam! Practically everybody in this country believes it's okay. It's true. It's true. We owe an income tax. When, in fact, we don't. We never did. That law was passed as well. The amendment was passed. The laws were passed. The regulations were passed. Created corporations, and then the, the crimes began in, 2000, in 1913. Uh, by imposing the tax on people that didn't know it and it wasn't imposed upon them by Congress or any regulation. So, I would end that terror, the IRS terror. No more income taxes on individuals. All right. We don't need to say a whole lot more about that. If you, if you have any problems with that, if you have any questions about that, <clears throat> I would suggest that you get all the book, get your hands on a book by Dave Champion, who is the leading expert on the income tax in America, as far as I know. He wrote a very nice book. It's rather long. It's 400 and some pages. But it's worth it. Because he knows and he explains the laws, the income tax laws, the federal tax laws, and so on, including the FICA tax, which is just another income tax. It has nothing to do with Social Security. And uh, he's got the references in there. To, to He cites the source of this information so that you can look up yourself. So get a hold of that book. The book is called Income Tax Shattering the Myths. And it does. I read it. It was an awesome book. <clears throat> and I recommend it highly. If you have any questions about what I've just told you about the income tax. All right. I think we can get one more topic in here uh, on what I would do if I were the president. Hold on a moment. Let me check my notes. All right. The next subject. Voter. Registration. The right to vote. If I were the president, I would direct Congress to create a national, universal, national, universal in the country, a national automatic voter registration process that every citizen in America, I'm talking about every citizen of America, this is 
say if you're a citizen of every state or any state, say 50 states, you will have a voter ID or a voter registration at birth. Now, there are people who would object to that on grounds of that's registering every human being, etc. But I don't think it's a good idea to wait until people become eligible to vote at some particular fantasy age, like 18, 21, 18, used to be 21. In my lifetime, it was 21. And a lot of people that were born after, say, 1970, don't even know about the fact that it used to be 21. It was changed, I believe it was in 1971. Or perhaps a little somewhere in that area. The voting age was changed and reduced to 18 from 21. So, uh, hey, if it can be changed from 21 to 18, it can be changed to, you know, 16 or 15. It's an arbitrary number. So, how about I direct Congress to establish a voter register of all citizens so that everyone who lives in this country they have a right to vote this right shall not be infringed by anybody in the government state or federal or local that everyone should have the right to vote I mean they have the right they're born because if you're a party to a, a group of people, a society, then you have a say in it. It's that simple. It's not complicated. Whether you're capable of making that, exercising that right at some point in your life is an individual consideration. Like if you're a year old, voting is not part of your vocabulary, not part of your consciousness. I'm two years old and I want to vote for Nixon, you know, whatever. You know, no. Because you don't have a clue. At what point does a human being get become conscious of the fact that they have the power and the right to select the representatives in government? <clears throat> now, I'm talking about a National Voter Right Act that would automatically make everybody eligible to vote in the country. And I'm talking about everyone, not just people that are like white. I mean everyone. If you live here, you're a citizen, as far as I'm concerned. So all the, I'm not going to get into this illegal alien immigrant crap right now, but I wouldn't be getting into that on the first day of, of, of my tenure as president anyway. But uh, within some time during my, let's say, the first hundred days, I would address that voting issue and the voter ID thing. Now, so, oh, you can't get an ID. It's discriminating against poor black people, etc. Yeah, well, yeah, maybe, but uh, this would solve that problem, wouldn't it? So this is the problem with America. You have a problem, you recognize the problem, you even know how the problem got to be a problem, and you know how to solve the problem by simply doing something that solves the problem and doesn't create another problem. So if you want to create a voter ID thing, then you have to do so without causing hardship to those people who have some difficulty getting a high voter ID. So, give them one. Just automatically make sure everyone has one. I mean, practically everybody in America has a social security number. <clears throat> yeah, truly. I mean, my kids got social security numbers basically on the day they were born. Because, you know, someone was there saying, you got to have a social security number. Got to open an account for that kid. He's a day old. Yep, got to. 
sorry, but you gotta. And so I did because I was ignorant. <coughs> Won't get into that at this point. So simply issue a photo ID. Yeah, sleepy. Voter ID to every citizen that qualifies as a citizen. I mean, if you're a foreigner living here, there's some question maybe that you're not a citizen. Like, if you're a Russian and you come over here to live, you're still a Russian. You're still a citizen of Russia. But you don't live there. You live here for a while. Say you're going to college. Or you're here to participate in, in some sort of uh, work-related issues. You know, like, uh, I'm going to teach at the University of Harvard, you know, for a year. So I'll German, I go over here and teach German in Harvard, at Harvard, or whatever, you know. Um, I'm still a German citizen, a Russian citizen, or English citizen, or African Chinese citizen, whatever. Um, and, you know, you, you don't necessarily get to say what goes on in the elections. And you wouldn't necessarily have a voter ID if you were a Chinese citizen that just happened to be living here temporarily. If you're an alien, uh, say, an immigrant from Mexico, and you, I'm going to the United States and live there because, you know, it's a nice place and I want to go there and you know, be free and shit. Well, you know, I'm not going to get into the free part because we're not that free. Anyway, if you're actually a citizen, live here, resident of a state in the Union, then, you know, give everybody a voter card. At what point? I'd say probably... If, if the current voting age is 18, then I would say by the time you're 18, you should have a photo ID issued to you by the government. Well, I think it should be federal because, you know, elections are federal, pretty much. I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, if you're a state, then you should have a state ID. It should be the same thing. You know, like a driver's license is good in every state, then, you know, your voter ID should be just send me one. Send everybody the damn thing when they turn 18. Problem solved. No cost, no charge. I mean, you know, taxpayers are going to pay for it. But that's the taxpayers are going to pay for it. Yeah. yeah. How much is it going to cost? You know the federal government sends out a millions, millions, billions probably. Billions of things every year. Or even every day, maybe. You know? How much could it cost? Certainly couldn't cost as much as... I mean, come on. Give it to them. Absorb. Okay, so let's say there's 300 million Americans that, you know, I can vote. And so, send out 300 photo ID cards. How are you going to get the photo, by the way? Uh, I'm not suggesting you should have a photo ID. That's something that's been recent, and it's not really a good idea, particularly. But at least give them a registration to vote. Give them the information, their name, perhaps address. Every Just everybody. Just send them out a card. Here's your card. You can vote now. When the election comes up, take your card, get down to the office. You know, if you want to, like, you know, just go and vote. And be done with it. That's the end of the problem. I know you're going to say, well, they don't have a photo ID. They might not be citizens. They might be terrorists, whatever. Blah, fuck that shit. All right? So we've solved that problem. Everybody gets a, it's an ID at some point before they become eligible to vote officially. Like I said, you're born with the right to vote. You have a say in your life, and you have a say in, in the world you live in the day you're born. You can't exercise that or articulate that, but you certainly have that right. Uh, that's another another issue there. I'll take that briefly. I'll mention that. Uh, you have all kinds of rights when you're born. That's why they're called inalienable, and that's why they're called natural. I know people don't say natural rights very much, but they should because they're natural. You know, you're born with them. 
like if there's no government, if there's no constitution, if there's no First Amendment or whatever, you still have the rights. In fact, I have a right to free speech any place on this friggin' planet. I just don't have the have the um, what do you call it? The power to exercise that, or the freedom to exercise certain things. You see what I'm saying? So I think voter IDs issued automatically. All right. So that's that subject taken care of. And it's only day two of my uh, administration as president of the United States. There are others. I think maybe we got another five minutes. Uh, let me see if I can think of a real quick one. All right, I'm going to wrap up this episode. I uh, don't have quite enough time to get into another one at this point. I've only got about uh, eight minutes, and that's not quite enough time. So let's just wrap it up here. And uh, I will continue this series, if I were the President of the United States, uh, on my next episode, or the one after that. All right, so share this, please, with everyone. And if you got to this point and you listened to the whole 36 and a half minutes of it, that is awesome. I hope you've learned something. I hope you've inspi been inspired. I hope that you have gained some insight. And I hope that any any insanities that you have in your head have been, uh, you know, like dispensed with as a result of what I've told you. And I've said some things that are opinions. And I've said some things that are logical conclusions and critical analytic observations and true substantiated confirmed factual statements leave it to you to decide which of these statements I made that are opinions but again I re re reiterate that I am not a conspiracy theory nut I have some theories that there are in some cases to some degree a conspiracy But it's got to be logical. It's got to be based on sound, solid evidence. You can't just make shit up and call it, oh, I've got a theory that, you know, the Illuminati is running the world or the Jews are taking over or whatever. That's just silly. And if you're going to repeat it because you saw it on the Internet, and you know, your credibility goes to zero. Because it's obvious to what you're saying is not true. It's obvious that you're just repeating it because you saw it on the Internet. I mean, come on. The Internet is not intended to be your source of conclusions. It is to give you, give you some information and data that you can think for yourself. Critical thinking, you know, that stuff you should have learned when you were like four years old. I mean, by the time you're 12, if you can't critically think, <laughs> then you're probably never going to. So anyway, <sighs> spread this around. Share it with your friends and neighbors and so forth. Facebook, YouTube, wherever. Twitter. And uh, hope, that, uh, hope that I've done you some help there. It's done you some good. Uh, by the way, I might be a narcissistic bastard, but I'm not a bastard. <laughs> narcissistic, maybe. Bastard, no. All right, so I'll catch you next time. Uh, thanks for listening, and I appreciate it. And we'll see you again later.